Welcome to Let's Get Metaphysical, the show that stretches you beyond your five senses. When you are looking for your next step on the path into the unseen, we've got you covered. Join epic adventure seekers and level up your game with your host, reality magician, Allie Bierman. Welcome to a very, very special edition of Let's Get Metaphysical, connecting heart and mind, and let's jump right in. Today, I welcome Rob Moore, a true renaissance man, to the show. He's a mentor and advisor to celebrities, multimillionaires. He was a starving artist, 50,000 pounds in debt at age 26, yet a millionaire before the age of 31. He's a best-selling author of 18 books, including Money, and one of my favorites, Opportunity, and his books are about wealth, but defining it in a way that most people don't understand it, and his podcast, and I highly, highly, highly recommend this podcast. The Disruptive Entrepreneur is the top business podcast. More than 700 episodes is followed by millions and downloads happen in 204 countries. He talks in the wealth arena, but it's the habits of the millionaires and the billionaires, the stuff that you don't hear when you're hearing all these hypes from pseudo gurus, in my opinion. And What I love about him is he shares a truth. It's not always what you want to hear, but in my opinion, it's also the truth. And he shares his personal journey, the ups, the downs, and what drives him. His money podcast teaches you how to make, to manage, and to master money. Money is not what most people think it is. He's a double public speaking world record holder, co-founder of Progressive Success and Progressive Property. He's the founder of the Rob Moore Foundation. He helps young and underprivileged entrepreneurs start meaningful businesses that change the world. And that's what he's all about. I could go on and on, but I (laughs) really want to... Get Rob live on here. Just uh, real quick, the personal side of him that he shares. He's a pilot, a helicopter pilot. He's a car enthusiast. He collects watches and vinyls, translated, that's records, and loves to do Legos with his kids. Rob is everywhere, and I am pretty sure he's cloned himself many times. So stop whatever you're doing. Sit down, fasten your seatbelt because Rob likes to talk and you want to listen to every word. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> as Obviously, it's my opinion that you're a renaissance man. You honor the invisible, the energy that drives our behaviors out of awareness. And you touch on the metaphysical aspects in your book. That's something else that differentiates you from the other people in the money arena. In fact, more than any other guest I've had today, you personify the goal of this show is to show people how the invisible forces in their life drive their behavior and their decisions. So um, a few months ago, I put out to the universe my wish, my goal to interview you. And then I let it go because, frankly, I didn't know how it happened, but I always put it out and let the universe figure it and show me the how to do it. And just a few days after that, I was in the right place at the right time, and the opportunity came up, and now I am so honored to have you here today. The wisdom that you share, especially your one-liners, I call them pearls. I actually have a page in my day planner called Rob Moore One-Liners, and that brings me to my first question. Do you believe that there's a universal mind, a place where all energy of thoughts and projects and all possibilities exist and we can choose to tap into it so i've pondered this for many years and i've studied the law of attraction i've studied a small amount of quantum the unified field the super conscious from you know people i respect and admire and I don't know that any one of us has figured it out where we can prove scientifically with fact that we are all one and we're all interconnected. 
but I can't help but think that we are. So I was having a chat with Joe Vitale, who was on The Secret, and I asked him about the unified field, or at least the, the interconnected nature. And he said that he believed there was a super conscious where every human being are connected in some way. So when you put a thought or intention out to the universe, whether it's a person or an event, it's almost like it sends a signal to 7 billion other people. And so things transpire to attract or repel. And I don't know if I'm being romantic, but I believe in that. To us, to the degree that there's so much stuff we can't explain through intention alone. I also feel that as a species, we're interconnected. So, you know, we need each other to survive. You know, let's say I'm a butcher and let's say you make shoes. Well, we need each other and we exchange within each other. So from a, a humanity point of view, we're interdependent and we're reliant on each other. So then it would make sense that we'd be able to communicate with each other in more ways than just verbal. And if you think about it, speech is something we learned. That, you know, millions, of, however many years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we couldn't speak. And speaking evolved as a way for us to communicate. So what's to say that in a thousand years or 10,000 years, we've figured out how we communicate as a global species with millions of others, whether you call it telepathy or energy or frequency or unified field or superconscious or whatever you want. So I think there's something in the connected nature of us all uh, and the superconscious or the unified field. Um, but because we can't see it, it's hard to articulate. So a physicist will tell you, there's only a very small spectrum of light that human beings can see. And there's all these waveforms and energy and light that we can't see. And if we could see it all, obviously the world would look different and just be waves flashing everywhere. But this is all energy, but it's energy that we can't see, but it doesn't mean it's not there. So what is there that we can't yet see? And uh, look, I'm an optimist and I'm a hopeful kind of guy. Uh, and I really do believe that there must be um, a way that we can connect with each other and communicate and attract with each other. Um, even space and time collapsing, i.e. the unified field theory says that past, present and future of every event in, in the history. So in infinity, space and time, past, present and future all exists in the unified field. And when you can tap into it, you pull out a present or a future moment. Of course, I'm talking very basics here, Ali. Um, so it's a really long way of saying, yes, <laughs> I believe in some kind of universal interconnected force. And how can we be the only species in the universe? I don't know if you've ever seen those videos where it says this is a human and it spans out and this is the, the Earth and this is our solar system and this and it spans out so much. And you're like, holy shit, we're so small and so insignificant. How can we be linked to, how can we only be in, independent, unconnected beings who only talk to each other? There has to be way more than that. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> there is, I, I'm, I'm very enthralled by space and astronomy. And the new telescope, not telescope, Miros that are about to be launched, it will only take them a month for it to reach its destination. Hopefully there won't be any more delays and they'll be able to see way back millions, millions of years. When I was a little wow. kid, I used to wonder, like with TV pictures and all, they were probably going out to space and I wondered if there was somebody out there who was watching them. Well, um, Ali, just one quick thing to add to that. If you think about time, time is a humanly constructed concept. Yeah, if yeah. you think about the past or the future, you could argue that's a humanly constructed concept. 
right. i.e. from a universal perspective, maybe time isn't linear. Maybe space and time can be collapsed or whatever you call it so that it infinitely exists in a, in a present moment. I, I think past, present and future and time are constructed by people, us, to make sense of a very complicated world. But if we try to unlabel the labels that we've created, you know, I remember reading something by Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he said that they'd, they'd managed to connect to a future event, 80 years in the future or something like that. I didn't, couldn't quite get my head around it. But human beings are very narrow in what we see compared to what's in the universe and energy and light. So why does past have to be past? It's in our mind, it happened 30 years ago, but really years is a time construct created by humanity. Who says a year or a minute actually even exists? Um, because if, if space is infinite and time is infinite, there's no such thing. You're very much on my wavelength. I, I tune into you so much. Many of your one-liners, they're things that I was teaching 20 years ago. Um, let me pull up an example. It's to know and not to do is not to know. For 20 years, I've been saying, when you know something, you live it. If you don't live it, you don't know it. So there are all those kinds of things. Uh, 25 years ago, I was actually writing on the early internet. And uh, 25 years later, I saw a quote, word for word, of something I had written in one of Wayne Dyer's pieces. So everything that you just said, it totally makes sense. And that's been my reality. And frankly, I don't care if people think I'm weird, because it would be boring if I wasn't weird. So. Every one of your books that I read and every podcast episode, you share views, as I mentioned before. They're not usually shared by people. And there are things people don't want to hear. And I didn't know how many, what kind of comments you got when you were sharing about the billionaire, the increase, the, was it 31 percent increase in billionaires in 2020 and you were just explaining basically money's energy can't create it or destroy it that's how it works so could you tell us a little bit more about that for people who haven't heard that and and agree with our president who said it's not fair it's like <laughs> hello sure so um i agree that money is energy and I think, is it the conservation law of energy that states that money can neither be created or destroyed, merely changing form? Um, and, and money, I believe, observes the law of energy. So, you know, you could burn paper, but all that happens is you've removed one form of money in the form of paper, but it doesn't stop money flow and money transaction. It just that particular money stops flowing, but then the government print more of it or people create cryptocurrencies or this barter or this DeFi, decentralized finance. So basically money over time changes form. And so, you know, at the moment people are talking a lot about all oh, cash and cashless society and, you know, there's no going to be no cash. Like, like it's the end of money. It's not the end of money. It's just the end or the potential end of one form of money. And money will continue to evolve and change form because money is a tool created by man. So what money actually is, is a universal exchange of value. It's a way to exchange energy more quickly and more globally. It's a way to measure energy exchange or transactional exchange more accurately. Like if you have a pair of shoes and I have one leg of a cow of meat and we want to barter, well, I'll be like, well, this is only worth one shoe. And you'd be like, no, 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 this is worth two shoes. And it's, it's inefficient and it's friction, you know, a, a lack of energy transfer, the barter system. But money is a, a much freer exchange of energy because you're like, well, my shoes are worth $30. I'm like, okay, well, um, this amount of meat is worth $30. So someone gives me $30 for this meat. I've got $30. I give you $30, I get those shoes. So money increases speed of energy transfer, and reduces friction of energy transfer. In fact, currency, the word currency, the history of the word, the etymology of the word is curare, Latin for flow. 
Money loves speed, money loves friction. So if you want to make more money, you've got to create more energy flow and more transaction and more fair exchange. And when you create that, you create more money. But if you um, make money, you haven't created it. It's just moved from the buyer to the seller or the seller to the buyer. And then if you buy something or give money away, you haven't destroyed it. You've just simply moved it from the seller to the buyer or the um, donor to the recipient. So money very much behaves like energy. So that's my answer to the first question. So um, being good at creating energy. So creating energy could be vibrating at a high frequency. It could be really good at pitching. It could be enthusiasm and passion for a product or service. It could be fair exchange. It could be removing friction to purchase. Like if you think, if you um, imagine, I don't know if you remember about 15 years ago, let's say, trying to buy online. You put your credit card details in, you've got to fill in like your whole life's history. You press a button, it doesn't load, it crashes, you've got to do it again. Then you press it again, the page takes ages to load, then you moved on to a third party secure part of your bank and then you've got to put a load of details in and then you buy your thing for $10. Oh, you want it? You forgot something for five dollars. You got to go and do it all again. And then Amazon created the one-click order button. That majorly removed friction, dramatically increased speed, and that's why more money flow goes to Amazon. Now, on the second question about billionaires, um, a lot of people think that billionaires should be capped, their earning potential should be capped, or that they. Um, you know, we don't need billionaires or that they're greedy or that they're tax evaders or whatever. But what people don't understand is billionaires have just created more economy, more energy flow, more distribution, more leverage, more convenience, more scale. There is no billionaire on the planet that's made billions without serving vast numbers of people. You, you can't. So when we attack these billionaires, one, from an energy perspective, that's the wrong thing because... Why is it that everyone looks at billionaires and goes, oh, you should be capped or you should be paying more tax? Why doesn't everyone look at themselves and go, how can I earn more money? Mm -hmm. So, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Like people say, oh, if we took, we had a wealth tax and took tax off the billions, we could rid world hunger and poverty. Well, there's only 3,000 billionaires, but there's probably 4 billion working people in the world who are earning money. So if you taught those 4 billion people to earn 20% more money, instead of trying to attack the billionaires who are actually creating our jobs and paying our taxes and building our schools and libraries and donating billions to our foundations and changing climate you know, change, instead of attacking them, why don't you try and change yourself? Like if everyone earned 10% more money and gave 2% of that away, 4 billion people, that'd be trillions of dollars. And, you know, I did a post on Facebook because Jeff Bezos got booed for donating half a million dollars to a children's charity. Like, it wasn't enough. But were those people who were booing him donating money? Probably mm. not. And, and do they know that in 2020, he was the highest donor in the world? He donated 10 billion to climate change. So, yeah, there's my answer to your two questions. I was very very naive when i was a teenager and i actually gave my high school valedictory address saying it's not right for some people to live in palatial homes while other people are poor and a few years later i met bob proctor and what he explained was if you redistribute the world equally the money equally across the world, it wouldn't take long for the same proportions to be restored that exist now. And I went on and explained all that on YouTube. And somebody commented, it was the first time I got a negative comment, you've sold out to the establishment. It's like, no, this is how things work, just like you explained. And it's so clear to me, it makes sense. More money you earn is a reflection of the number of lives you're touching for the better. At least I hope it's for the better. Now, I know that you have repeatedly retired. Mm -hmm. What drives you to return? I'm so grateful that you keep returning, but I don't think it's boredom that brings you back. Yeah, so I retired in my late 20s, early 30s, mid-30s, mid and then last year. Um, 
I don't think retirement is stopping work. I think retirement is moving on to something else and leaving behind what you were doing. So in some ways you could say, well, I, they were false retirements because I'm back working. But in other ways they weren't because when you tell everyone you're retired, it stops all the incoming messages, which is good because sometimes I get overwhelmed with the incoming messages. But really for me, retirement is about out with the old and in with the new. So I um, retired operationally in my companies about 18 months ago to focus on creating content and my foundation and building my personal brand and done really well in that this year. Um, but I've sort of gone back in to help navigate our businesses through COVID and, and reinvent it and scale it. So I retired when I became financially free from property and then the re recession happened and then I was not quite as financially secure as I thought I was. And then I retired when I became a millionaire and then you realize actually a million, it's actually not a lot. You can't live for 50 years off 1 million pounds. You know, I think, you know, 10 million is the new million. So there were retirements and then realizations after retirements. When my son was really good at golf and we were playing golf around the world with him in the world under five and six British and European and world championships, I retired again then and took a, uh, that was more of a sabbatical for a few months to travel around the world. Um, I'm never going to say that I won't retire again, but what it'll probably mean is I'm doing something else, but I'm pretty committed for my life to help as many people on this planet starting to go their business and get better financial knowledge. I'm also very committed to creating a lot of content across all media and helping people start and scale their business and get better financial knowledge. So I can imagine I'll be a creator of some kind or, a, um, you know, writing books or doing podcasts or doing interviews or doing lives or whatever. But I can imagine I'll probably juggle around my companies and, you know, we probably we, we bought a lot of property recently. We've just developed 99 apartments and we're doing another 45. I should think once they're done, we probably won't go as aggressive on buying because, you know, we've probably got a two million dollar a year rent roll now. And, you know, I, I like money, but I don't need billions. Bearing in mind, we have other companies as well and about nine income streams. So I, I just like the flexibility, really, and the freedom I've retired from various things and then decided. I think most people's version of retirement is to do nothing. And I've tried doing nothing and it's not fun. And, you know, I want it to be more meaningful than just doing nothing, which is why when I retired, I wrote a new book or started a new company or whatever. So I look forward to many more retirements, Ali, in the future when I retire from one thing to move into something else. Totally makes sense when companies retire a product. The companies mm. like, I never thought of that before. I wanted to be sure before we go to touch on. I am so touched the way you share your family. And I was on a master class with you, and you were on. I think you were on a couch, and your dad was on another couch. And I knew the story of you and your dad and your family, and it was like that was so cool to see. And there. Are, more than 400 people on this class and the phone rang and you picked it up. It was your daughter. You picked it up. And I just, I love your values, what you teach and you'll always be the role models to your kids, but to the rest of the world and everything in your values, it's not just for business. And that's a message I really want all the listeners here to get. This is how you live your life in all areas because you're not just a filter of seeing only one reality. And I'm so grateful to you for that. And also when you were speaking before 500 people and your business partner called and you knew that he knew you were talking to 500 people. Mm -hmm. So you knew that had to be important and you answered it and took care of your business. And to me, it's the only way to live. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. And I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being you. And wonder if you have any specific message that you want to leave with us today yeah i do because i finish every piece of content i've ever created i think since i came up with this quote if you don't risk anything you risk everything and i really believe too many of us scared to be ourselves to scared to put our work out there scared to try things scared to start a business scared to walk away from a job scared to 
take a bit of a financial risk, you know, scared to put your opinion out for fear of being judged, scared to go live on social media, scared, scared, scared. And I would just say, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. And if you don't face these fears you have and confront these challenges and try and transcend them, defeat them, smash through them, work around them. I think it was Will Smith. I think he said, if you can't beat the fear, just do it scared. And I think that's really resonant because, you know, I've spent a lot of my life being worried about what people think about me, trying to get over, you know, being the fattest kid in my year at, at school for three years and feeling unloved and unvalued and lost and lonely and building up these coping mechanisms of, you know, being good at people pleasing, but then you spend your life people pleasing and then you can't please yourself. So take some risks, be bold, be brave, have fun doing it. Don't take yourself too seriously um, because you'll never regret the things you tried. You'll only regret the things you didn't try. And this interview. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I have all the ways to contact Robby in the show notes. And I encourage you to grab as many of them as you <laughs> can, because it will change your life. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robbie. Ali. Thanks thank a you. lot for having me on your show. Thank you for being you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to a talk on the wilder side. Thanks for tuning in to Let's Get Metaphysical. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every Monday for more exciting insights and wisdom on life beyond your five senses. Until next time, take a small step in a new direction. Start now.